About 10 years ago now, my wife can probably help me with, with the timing of this, but I was doing a little yard work in the spring. Uh, anybody getting ready for spring cleanup in the garden or around the house or the garage, feeling that cabin fever itch? Uh, yeah, it, it was one of those types of, of Saturdays. And I'm in the backyard, I'm working in the garden area, doing some work, and, and at the time, our, our home had an attached garage. And through, through kind of the window, the back of the garage area, I noticed this man in my garage. And I, I walk into the back of the house and into the garage, and can I help you? Oh, oh, sorry, sorry, are you going to have a garage sale? Um, no, no, I'm not. Oh, okay, and his wife came up and she's like, I am so sorry, he's always trying to get to garage sales before other people so he can get the best deals. Crazy garage sale people out there. We're getting on that time of year. I mean... I saw this strange man in my house uninvited. Not cool, right? Not cool. I I understood, though, that his intention wasn't to steal anything. He was just wanting a good deal. He, He had the right intentions. He didn't have the proper boundaries, right? (laughs) Fast forward, or or I guess go in reverse a a few more years in, in the past, And I remember another time when I felt like my personal boundaries were kind of violated in my house. It was during the birth of my first daughter. I I love my my mother-in-law and my own mother, and I love the fact that they wanted to come and help clean and prepare our house. It It was amazing. But do you know that every single person thinks that socks need to go in a different location? I don't think I found my socks for a month. And I had no clue where stuff in the kitchen was. I could could find nothing. uh, If you've been around for a while, you know I can't find the ketchup in the fridge anyway. So when something isn't in its normal location, I am totally lost. Their intentions were amazing, though. And I absolutely love it. And it was a great time. But they kind of violated my house even though it was, it was okay and it was proper. I think of another time when my younger daughter, Naomi, she was around four years old, and, and uh, pastor's kids, they, they pick up on the whole sin and Jesus thing a little bit earlier because they're in church all the time, and, and we intentionally read scripture and talk about it and, and those types of things. I'm not saying it's only pastor's kids, but often they pick it up quick. And one Sunday after church, we're sitting around the table eating Sunday dinner, and and she's like, Daddy, how does Jesus get in my heart? Just as as pure as can be. And she's like, he's, he's a man. How does he fit in there? She wanted to know. She wanted to know. She wanted to invite him into her heart. She knew she had sin in her little four-year-old mind. She understood what it was. And she wanted Jesus to come in to her heart. And let, she wanted to let him in to clean up her mess. I kind of thought that she might be thinking he was going to clean her room. I wasn't sure at that point. You see... There's a place that we need cleaning. There's a place we need to let Jesus in. It's our lives, our hearts. Just like scripture says, he stands at the door and knocks. And he wants to come in and and transform us from the inside out. And he has the best intentions. And the reality is, we, we just need to understand, is it something we truly want or not? We have an amazing God who loves us in spite of our mess, 
and wants to come in and just clean house. He wants to come in and clean house. And that's what Jesus means in Matthew 5, 8. This next beatitude that we come to this morning, when he says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. The pure in heart. Blessed are those that, that are of the same substance completely. That's what it means to be pure, right? Pure gold is worth more than gold that's mixed with other metals. Pure diamonds, even the small ones, the more pure they are, are more valuable than the larger ones that are, aren't very pure. And Jesus says in this beatitude, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. God blesses you when you're pure in heart. And, and I tried to think about a word or a phrase, what that might sound like today in our modern English language. And I think we have a word for it. I think we have a word for being of the same substance internally as it appears externally to others. It's called integrity. Integrity. Integrity is being the same person when you're alone, the same person when you're at work, the same person when you're at home, when you're talking to your kids. It's being the same person from the inside out. And that is what Jesus was getting at here. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. They will see God. And now, it's important as we start talking about this and, and really digging into what Jesus is getting at here, that we understand, we understand none of us are perfect. All of us are marred by sin and we live in a sinful world. Just as Paul wrote to the Romans in Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. See, that's one of the first parts in recognizing that you need Jesus in your life is recognizing you are not pure. And you need to let him in and let him clean up that mess so that you can be pure, you can be the same person. And just think about people throughout scripture. Think about people like, like King David and and, and Abraham and Moses and, and even Noah, people that God used greatly. And just what a mess they had in their lives. And we only get snapshots of their lives. I, I think about King David. God called King David a man after his own heart. And then after we hear of that, what, what did David do? He went and had an affair and had the man killed. Of the, of the woman that he had an affair with. Noah, he got drunk, and let's just say it was not a pretty picture after the fact. There was a huge curse involved, and, and uh, if you talk about like family tragedy, Jerry Springer show stuff, I mean, just look at Noah. He was the first Jerry Springer. I mean, right there. Moses. Moses killed a man before he ran away from his home, and then after God started using him in a mighty way and he was following God, he, he came to a place where he even took partial credit for a miracle of God. Paul, the Apostle Paul, before he had an encounter and was transformed by Christ, he literally hunted down Christians to imprison them, to torture them to see them killed. He literally held the coats of other Jews who stoned the first Christian martyr, Stephen, to death, and he encouraged them. So when Paul says, for all sin has fallen short of the glory of God, he knew what it meant. He knew what it meant. But we can learn from, from these biblical heroes. We can learn from them that we don't need to be perfect because we have a good God. But just because we don't need to be perfect doesn't mean that we don't strive to be better. You see, we need to be forgiven. Just as we need a transformed heart that is wholly committed to God. And that's what Jesus is getting. That your heart is completely committed to God. 
Not that you're incapable of making mistakes at the, or that you should be canonized and, and into the, this perfect being. It doesn't exist. God is more interested in seeing your heart committed to him than seeing the sin you've committed. Do, do I need to say that again? God's more interested in seeing your heart committed to him than seeing the sin you've committed. I like how Samuel puts it. 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. God says, people look at the outward appearance, but the Lord, he looks at the heart. The Lord looks at the heart. No, we'll never be perfect. We, myself included, we'll never be perfect. Not, not this side of heaven, not in this life. We will never be sinless, but we can sin less. And that's the point when we fully commit our lives to God. That as we grow, as we continue to be transformed, we sin less. And that happens when we experience the pardon of God in our lives. And we start following him. I mean... When I, when I think of Jesus' words, blessed are the pure in spirit, for they will see God. Do you want to be one of those people that sees God? I think that would be pretty cool. <laughs> I think that would be all right. I want to see God. I want to see God. Well, what does it mean to have a pure heart then? Because those who have a pure heart will see God. What does it mean to have a pure heart? Well, a pure heart, if we search throughout Scripture, means at least a few things. The first thing it means is that your heart is undivided. Your heart is undivided. You're wholly committed to God. Not that you're, you're, you never sin, like I said, but you sin less. You, you do your best to commit your life to God. And Here's the reality. A lot of people, and, and myself included, because we can fall back into this really easy. A lot of people, we think our life is like a pie. I like pie. But we think our life is like pie. That there, there's this little slice right here for our career. And then there's another slice over here that, that's my, my, my politics. And then there's another slice over here for my family life or my friends or here's a slice for my spiritual life. If you segment your life like that, you lack a pure heart. You lack integrity because your life is not whole. It's not wholly committed to God. It's not undivided. It's not pure Integrity means you are the same person through and through, at work, at home, at church. And to have a pure heart means your heart is undivided. It's wholly committed to God. It means your heart is authentic. Not just undivided, but it's authentic. And in the, in the Greek culture, there was a word that actors were referred to. It's called hypocrites. Anybody ever hear that word before? Hypocrite? During Jesus' times, actors were called hypocrites and not in a negative way. It meant that they portrayed someone who they really were not. So when you think about Jesus calling the Pharisees hypocrites, what do you think he was saying? When you wear masks so that you appear to be different to one person or to other people, than you really are, then your life isn't whole. It's undivided. Your heart, or your heart is divided. It's not pure. Your heart needs to be authentic. You need to be real. You need to be the same person everywhere with an undivided heart. And the third thing, what it means to be pure in heart, it means that you're your heart has the correct motivation. Your heart has the correct motivation. See, your intentions matter. Your motives matter to God. 
It matters deeply. It, this means that you, you do the right thing, but you do the right thing for the right reasons. That's important. You have unmixed motivation. You have pure motives. You're sincere. You're straightforward. You realize that, that uh, you know, we don't, we don't talk a lot these days about being pure in heart. We, we just don't. We use that word integrity, and integrity is a good way to describe being pure in heart because it means being the same person everywhere you go. And, and just honestly, right, we are, we are worried about our image. Every single person to, to a certain extent is worried about their image. It's just part of human nature. But God is more interested in your integrity. He wants you to be the same person. We're interested in our reputation, but God's interested in our character. Reputation is what people think about you. Integrity is who you really are. Reputation is, is who you are in public. Integrity is, is what you are and who you are when you're all alone. King Solomon wrote in Proverbs 11, verse 20, he said this, the Lord detests people with crooked hearts, but he delights in those with integrity. The reality is a lot of people we segment our lives. We segment our lives and we think we can live with integrity in harboring sin in one area of our life. It's in this one closet and we don't, we don't talk about it. We end up visiting that closet. We go to that room from time to time, but as long as, as nobody else sees it, it's okay. Have you heard that phrase? Or maybe you've said it. As long as it doesn't hurt anybody else. Have, have you ever referred to sin in that way or somebody else's sin? As long as it doesn't hurt anybody else, it's okay. See, I, I, I heard one preacher call it the Titanic myth. Everybody knows what the Titanic is, right? Yeah, unsinkable ship. It was the first just giant freight liner, passenger liner ship made out of steel, unsinkable because it was segmented. And they thought that even a massive hole in one area that they could seal off that one compartment and the ship would still float. How did that work for them? It's the Titanic myth that, oh, it's just that one sin. It'll be okay. Well, this is why it's not. Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. God wants you to be wholly committed. Not that we won't ever make mistakes, because we will. But friends, when, you come to your, come, come to, when it comes to your life, a hole in the boat is still a hole in a boat. And eventually, it's going to sink you. That little area you thought you had under control will eventually take you down. And it will affect the people around you because sin is not personal. It is never personal. It never stays private. Even if you think you've got it hidden and nobody will ever know, your attitudes, your behaviors, your decisions are all predicated on that sin staying covered up. And it changes and impacts the world around you. Every sin ends up impacting the people around you in the long run. And any sin will sink us. You see, that's why integrity is a choice. A pure heart is a choice. I like how God describes this in Job chapter 8, verses 5 through 7. It says this, If you pray to God and seek the favor of the Almighty, and if you are pure, 
and live with integrity, he will surely rise up and restore your happy home. And though you started with little, you will end with much. See, this this message this morning may be a tough message to hear because integrity, oftentimes when we talk about this, or we read scripture about this, what we end up doing is replaying the, the blooper reel of our life. You see the, see the little clips on social media or on TV, it's like the America's Funniest Home Videos that everybody likes to enjoy when other people fail. But oftentimes when we talk about integrity and being pure in heart and we start thinking through this thoroughly, we start playing that failure real in our minds of where we messed up. But our God is so good. So good. He just wants us to admit our failures, our mistakes, our sin. And he promises to forgive us when we wholly commit to him with the right motives, the right heart. And I think it's important to to really consider ways in which we can display a pure heart because it's really a transformation from the inside out. And I've just got a list of five ways that we can show that we have a pure heart. Five ways that we we can literally work on to make us people of better integrity, to to refine our hearts, to refine our lives. And the first thing is this, keep your promises. Keep your promises. People of integrity, they keep their word. If they say they'll do it, they do it. If they say they'll be there, they show up. If they end up being late, they'll text or call and say, hey, I'm running behind. The Bible says in Proverbs 25, 14, people who promise things that they never give are like clouds and wind that bring no rain. Talk to a farmer in drought time about clouds and wind that bring no rain and how how favorably they look at those. (laughs) Yeah. One of the ways that we can display our pure heart, our integrity, is to keep our promises. Number two, refuse to gossip. Refuse to gossip. God is looking for men and women of integrity who know how to keep a secret and not pass it around. Who know how to keep confidence and not put it on social media. Don't talk about people behind their back. Don't even listen to that stuff. Look at what Proverbs eleven thirteen 13 says. I like how Eugene Peterson puts it in the message. He says, gossip can't be trusted with a secret, but someone of integrity won't violate a confidence. This is just another way of saying people that gossip to you will gossip about you, right? And we know this. And I cannot tell you the number of times that, that I've heard that, a prayer meeting turn into a gossip session before somebody chimes in and starts to really infer and sometimes take over and say, now we're getting close to gossip here. (laughs) So let's pray about what we do know. That's needed. That's needed. Displaying a pure heart means you're keeping your promises. It means you're refusing to gossip. And here's another one. It means you're faithfully tithing. You're faithfully tithing. You see, wherever you put your money first is what's important to you. I remember Dave Ramsey, I've said it before because it's such a great illustration. He says, show me your, your checkbook and I'll show you your priorities. Where you put your money first shows what's most important to you. And I go to Malachi for this. This is such a great passage. Malachi says it like this. Is it right for a person to cheat God? Of course not. Yet you are cheating me. How, you ask? In the matter of tithes and offerings. Bring the full amount of your tithes to the temple. 
Put me the test, and you will see that I will open the windows of heaven and pour out on you in abundance all kinds of good things. Integrity means putting your money where your heart is. It needs to be with Jesus and his work. And, and just a side note, you know that a tithe is different than a gift or an offering, right? A gift or an offering is something that you designate, that, that you feel led by God to give. A tithe is giving to the church. And one of the amazing blessings when we give tithes to the church is there can be no pride attached to that because we don't choose where our money to go. It goes to God's work, through God's people, through his church, and he gets the glory for the outcome. It's different than a gift or offering. And it's important where we give our money. Just as Jesus said, you, you can't serve one master and the, the God of money and our true God. You can't do both. It's important to be pure, have integrity through and through, putting first things first, even when it comes to finances. Wherever you put your money first is what's most important to you. And God wants us wholly committed to him. Number four, doing your best at work. Doing your best at work. Might sound strange, but God cares about how you work and your intentions when you work, the heart that you have when you work. Paul says in Colossians 3.23, he says this, work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. If you're a believer, if you follow Christ as your Lord and Savior, your real boss is God. And whatever or whether anybody else sees your work or not, God sees it and he blesses it. He truly blesses it. You don't go to work for a paycheck, you go to work for the Lord. And I gotta tell you, whenever you work with people that are truly working for the Lord, they're the ones that really bring up the entire area, the entire office the entire assembly line, the entire nursing floor, the entire school. They're like that light that is being lit out there for everyone to see. It's amazing to see people working for the Lord. It truly is. And so five ways. Keep your promises. Refuse to gossip. Faithfully tithe. Faithfully give to God. Regularly, weekly, monthly. Do your best at work. And here's the fifth one. Be real with others. Be real. Be real with others. A person of integrity doesn't act one way in church and another way at work, another way at home, another way on the golf course, another way with friends out of town. Be real with others. Second Corinthians 4.2 is a good passage for this. We refuse to wear masks and play games. We don't maneuver and manipulate behind scenes, and we don't twist God's word to suit ourselves. Rather, we keep everything we do and say out in the open. Now, I realize that, that on any given Sunday morning, there are people that are here because it's like checking the box. It's something you do every week. There are other people that you're dragged here by your spouse or your mom or, or a loved one or, or you're trying to prove something. Maybe, maybe you're here and you don't even know why this Sunday. God knows why. He's working on your heart. And he wants us to have pure hearts, hearts wholly committed to him. And he's working on our integrity. And he wants us to see him in all of his glory, in our heavenly home. Let me illustrate it like this. I had a grandma that had that front room in the house 
I've talked about this before, that had the, the plastic slip cover on the couch that nobody could play on, right? It was, it was the good couch, the good room. See, oftentimes as people, we have that good room, that, that best face forward. And here's what happens. When you don't expect anybody to come over and you have laundry on the sofa, you have lunch leftovers on the, on the end table, they, they knock on the door. You, you might peek out the window or out the blinds or anymore, you shut everything off and you're quiet and you pretend you're not there. But here's the reality. Here's the reality. Jesus is knocking on that door. And he's got a mop and he's got a bucket and he's got cleaning supplies. And he wants to come into your house. Not just the good room. He wants to go into every room of your house. Not just the ones that, that are the me a mess and other people know it. He wants to go to that closet that has those skeletons in there that you don't want to tell anybody about and nobody knows about but you. He wants to clean them out. He wants you to be pure from the inside out. He wants you to have a transformed heart. And when your heart's transformed, your life transforms as well. Would you please stand with me? Please stand as, as we go to the Lord in prayer. Now I want you to bow your heads with me. And just, just listen to my voice. Here's the question, how do we get a heart of integrity, a pure heart? How do we get an undivided heart? We have to ask for it. We have to let Jesus in. The Bible tells us that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Only God can give us that kind of heart. A heart that wants what God wants and only what he wants and always what he wants, a pure heart. Keep your eyes closed, let's pray. God, we confess our sins, our mess. Our house is your house. Please come in and clean up. Forgive us of our sins, Jesus. It's only by your grace and shed blood on the cross that we can be free from the filth that holds us down and holds us back and holds us, so keeping us from being all that you've created us to be. Jesus, come into our hearts. Make it fully yours. And then we will know that we will see you on that glorious day. In Christ's name we pray.